Hello, I'm Tatiana Maslany, and these are the movies that changed my life. Hey everyone, I'm Ian DeBorha, and welcome to IMDb's Movies That Changed My Life, a podcast where your favorite stars break down the films that made them who they are today. This week's guest is Tatiana Maslany. You may know Tatiana from her Emmy award-winning performances in BBC America's Orphan Black, but you will also be able to catch her on HBO's Perry Mason as the incredible Sister Alice. In addition to talking about the movies that changed her life, Tatiana and I talk about our love of fandoms, bringing back the clones for the Orphan Black charity read, and much more. Before we start, I want to give a quick shout out to Coolia72, JVP Media, and Hollywood Star 101 for the reviews on Apple Podcasts. If you haven't yet, don't forget to leave us a review and I'll give you a shout out next week. Thanks for listening. Now here's Movies That Changed My Life with Tatiana Maslany. I mean, your movie choices don't really surprise me because there's a huge, wide range of them. Uh, very <laughs> similar to uh, your beloved role as the clones in uh, Orphan Black. Uh-huh. Um, and something in my research I came across is that you, in a Reddit AMA, gave the clones favorite movies. I did? You did do that. Yes, you did. Oh, my God. What so, did okay, I say? Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say the name of the movie and see yeah. if you can reverse engineer it. Okay? okay, great. So the first one you have listed is Jurassic Park. What? Um, uh, 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 Helena? No. Kasima, 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 Yes, Kasima, Kasima. Of course. Sorry. Okay. The next one is West Side Story. Oh, Allison. Oh, obviously. <laughs> yeah, I mean, cool. uh, <laughs> uh, Cinderella. Uh, uh, um, Helena? Yes. Ooh, I, I like that. I feel yes, like I yes. knew more about her than, than I do now. <laughs> I'm interested uh, in that choice. And then Lahane. Ooh, Sarah. Yes. And yeah. then finally, Casablanca. Rachel? Yes. Yeah. So the, <laughs> uh, do the you think those I never finished? <laughs> <laughs> do you think those two still hold those picks still hold up or now that you're a little stepped away from it, uh, maybe you, you would make some additions there or swaps? I think Cosima would be like, yeah, Jurassic Park was like a fun, like she loved it, like for the, the kitsch value. Mm-hmm. But I feel like there would have been movies since I don't know that she would. I think she might have been a Criterion gal. Mm, so okay. Anything from that, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thousands I, of movies on that. <laughs> she has to be a subscriber to the channel to. Yes, she subscribed to, get her to the fixed. channel. However, she actually finished any one of the films that she started. <laughs> <laughs> Unlike me. Um, something I love about Orphan Black and the hashtag Clone Club is that even when I didn't watch the show, I knew everything about orphan black and the clones like anytime you go to a comic-con like people are dressed up you know everyone knows when you're going to be on a panel and stuff like that and that still holds up like very much through today i mean it's amazing even the power just keeps going and going and you recently did uh a a charity table read and that sort of stuff so is it fun just to sit back you know what two or three years um after the show ended and just to get you know revisit those characters I, yeah, I mean, that was so much fun. It was daunting because it was surprising to me how the muscle memory of the characters was completely like, like I was like soft. I was working with noodles. Like I had nothing. <laughs> I was like not, I, I, they were, the accents were hard. The character, like the vo- vocal placement was weird. It just, I was talking to Catherine who played, um, who plays my clone devil. And she and I were both like, my God, that was really hard to come back to yeah at one point it was so second nature we would switch you know three times during a, a table read and then it, it it just does not it's not there these bones are old <laughs> but it but what's cool about it too is that like clone club showed up so hard for that live read and like donated so much money we were just so blown away and centerlink and sistering um in toronto have both like got a, a, a lot of funds from that which was just Um, unbelievable and such a testament to like that community and how strong it has kept itself like they really they really are like an amazing family yeah I love it like um it always warms my heart when I see people who have such huge fan bases still you know connecting with their fans even though the show's gone you're always tweeting out or retweeting clone club things and I mean 
you know, as a fan who loves fandoms, like every time I see that, it's like, oh, that's it, it. Really, like, completes the circle of why you like love a show or a specific actor or something like that. But I'm like the same. I, I there are certain fandoms that I'm part of that, like, I still get a Beastie Boys like Happy Birthday um, email from like the Beastie Boys message board. <laughs> from, I don't know when I signed up for that, but it would have been like you know when message boards were way a thing. long ago. <laughs> yeah, um, and you know, there's certain like I'm. I'm such a fan. So I know what that feels like. And I'm, I, you know, I'm on both sides of it, I guess. So let's talk about your new project, Perry Mason on HBO. Um, do you want to tell us what the show is about? And then about your incredible character of sister Alice. Yeah. So Perry Mason is like um, a TV series that existed in the sixties. And it was about a criminal defense lawyer and basically like kind of a procedural um, him, him in doing very like, doing various cases <laughs> knows a lot about law. Um, uh, yeah. And, but this, this, um, version of it takes place before he became a defense lawyer. So he's sort of discovering that aspect of himself, discovering that justice, uh, that seeking justice and played by Matthew Reese, who is just like the most incredible. Oh my God. Like the greatest lead actor I've ever worked with in the sense that he just, was tireless, was so funny and fun, constantly like playing, just so there for every scene partner and there for the whole crew. Like it was just the most like joyful experience. And he brings this like real, you know, Matthew Reese style, like grit and humor to the character. And John Lithgow's in it and um, Shea Wiggum's in it and Gail Rankin. And yeah, it's Chris Chalk. It's wild. And it's shot really, really, really well. I mean, it looks like any. Did you see it? Yeah, yeah. I got to see oh. two, two or three episodes. Nice. Um, and it's shot beautifully. So many cool film noir shadows and shots that really like take you back to the time that obviously it takes place. And you play Sister Alice, and your character introduction is so cool. <laughs> um, and can can you tell tell the folks who Sister Alice is? Yeah, so Sister Alice is kind of this celebrity preacher who preaches for thousands of people um, and is the head of this church. Uh, she's like kind of like a rock star in the sense that people follow her and she does these big performances that are just larger than life at a time, I think, when people were really needing hope and really needing religion in this deep, deep way to give them the possibility of a future. And she, um, the church really capitalizes on that need and has found like, you know, a real hole for her to fill kind of thing. Um, and Alice is like part, like she's sort of like Shirley Temple in that she's got like, you know, like a stage presence, like a persona. Yeah. And then we also get to see her side, her, her like private side, which is even there kind of curated by her mother and sort of um, really under the watch of her mother and really under the guidance of her mother in you know, for better or for worse. Um, but she's just like, I remember reading the script. She pops up, I think in the second episode mm -hmm. and I was just like laughing because I was so surprised by her. And so kind of like, I just never read that kind of character before and was like, how do I get to play this? This is so wild. Did you, did you happen to study any like old, um, gospel preachers, anything like that? Do you have any specific like old videos you saw from the time that sort of drew your inspiration as to how you wanted Sister Alice to be? Yeah. I mean, there's a, there's a woman who, um, created this church or headed this church, um, called Amy Simple McPherson, who was basically who this character is kind of oh, okay. like derived from. Um, and she was from small town, Canada, came to LA and like, created this empire which still has a church in echo park you can pass it it's this big circular church huh. um and still has sermon you know they still have services there she's obviously not uh, around anymore but but she really was the beginning of those like the mega church movement and she had her own radio show and she disappeared for like years they thought she <laughs> ran off into the ocean then they like <laughs> found her in the desert like there's all this nuts kind of lore around her so I definitely like pulled from that kind of like larger than life persona and just like you know musicians that I love Karen O her mm. kind of you know performance style Karen o. 
nice. you know what I mean? Like, now that you say that, it's so like it's very, very obvious that you're pulling from her. Like, yeah, the way Karano is on stage is it's it's really unique. Like, you don't really see anyone do it. Like, that's funny. I like that. It's eight episodes, correct? Yeah, eight episode first season. Yeah, um, very much looking forward to see the rest of it, and I'm awesome. sure fans will also be very excited for that. All right, so let's get into the movies that change your life. Where do you want to start off with? I yeah. can talk about all these for an hour. You, so. Yeah, like just, just let, I don't know. I, I, where do you start? Let's go chronologically. Okay. Uh, so this is going to be uh, a woman under the influence. Eight point two out of ten. Uh, Nineteen thousand ratings on IMDb. Written and directed by John Cassavetes, starring Jenna Rollins and Peter Falk. Uh, the synopsis is Mabel, a wife and mother, is loved by her husband, Nick, but her mental illness proves to be a problem in their marriage. Gina Rollins got nominated for Best Actress, uh, and Cassavetes got nominated for Best Director. Peter Falk wasn't wasn't nominated? He was not nominated. I know. That's it's crazy, nuts. right? It's nuts. It's but like also you can't fathom like that without all of the component like the bits being together. You know what I mean? Uh, I mean it was a stacked year, to be fair. Uh-huh. Uh, it was the same year as the Godfather Part Two. So De Niro won for fair, that. Fair. And three three actors got nominated for Best Supporting Role from Godfather 2. And if he was up against for Best Actor, he would have gone up against Jack Nicholson for Chinatown, Dustin mm-hmm. Hoffman for Lenny, Pacino for Godfather, Albert Finney in Murder on the Orient Express. But the winner was Art Carney and Harry and Tonto. So very uh-huh. stacked, super stacked year. Yeah, like just um, classics, only classics. Yeah, it's all classics. I mean, uh-huh. you, can't, you can't knock any one of those. Yeah. Um, so, so talk to us about Woman of the Influence. Um, when was the first time you saw it? All that sorts of stuff. So I moved to Toronto when I turned 20 and I'd been acting since I was like nine years old. I'd been doing TV, film, theater, improv, musical theater, everything. Like hadn't stopped working, um, kind of fell into it ass backwards and decided to move to Toronto when I turned 20 to, to uh, try my hand at like living in a bigger center. Um, and I started studying film uh, or studying acting at that time. I hadn't really studied it. I'd done like community theater classes and young people's theater and stuff like that, which was invaluable, but wasn't necessarily like conducive to film acting. Started taking like film classes and, and Meisner and, and stuff like that. And met this, um, I was doing a movie called The Vow. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, very in line with everything I was doing, Meisner and all of that. <laughs> um, but I, I was on this movie called The Vow and I met um, one of now my best friends, his name's Joey Klein, and he directed this movie that I did a few years back called The Other Half. And he brought The Other Half to me, the script. He had it back then, like it was like, this is like over 10 years ago. And I read the script and he wanted to do it with me. He wanted me to play this lead role of Emily. And one of the references he cited for it was a woman under the influence. And I, I had had zero kind of zero exposure to Cassavetes. Mm-hmm. had never seen faces or, or shadows or anything and was just like, I can't describe cause it's, it's still an emotional thing for me to talk about her performance in it. <sighs> and I just rewatched it this morning again, just to like, just have it fresh. Yeah. And I was like, seeing new things and and felt that like I was just so moved by it it was particularly that dinner scene or the post pasta scene mm-hmm. where oh, he yeah. oh. gets all of his friends out because she's like embarrassed him by being extra (laughs) singing and opera yeah Yeah, and she's like looking in the guy's mouth while he's singing and stuff she says to him across the table she's like tell me nick tell me what you want me to be and i can be that i can be anything and she does all these little like and these little like these like Mm -hmm. hand these hand things and little ticks kind of little ticks yeah but they're so relatable and they're so human and they're so funny and like beyond anything i'd ever seen a woman or a man do on screen. She just had this like animal thing about her that was so human that I just still, when I'm feeling uninspired is always the, I always go back to that scene. Gina Rollins is so amazing. Honestly, I think it's probably one of my favorite performances I've seen also on film. She is unbelievable from start to finish, especially like the way the, the, the movie opens up. Um, where you kind of get the impression that, oh, you know, her husband, Peter Falk, doesn't come back from work. And so she goes out to the bar and you just think, oh, like maybe she's just like a bit of an alcoholic. But then Mm -hmm. as like the story unfolds, you really realize like, oh, there's, you know, she has, um, 
you know, there's some mental c- capacity things going on there mm-hmm. or, or mental um, illnesses. Mm-hmm. And then you really start to like immediately flip on like, oh my God, like she is like going through something that, you know, at the time in the 70s, it, 74, it wasn't really, um, you know, maybe not as well understood. And it's so cool that they brought like this really, really heavy and like so realistic like portrayal of how families have to deal with, you know, people with mental illnesses and stuff in this like very forward, forward way. I mean, it's, um, yeah. And in the context of the time would have been not only thematically and like subject matter wise, really revolutionary, but also the way the actors are behaving this like patient feels improvised, but was always like tightly scripted, which has always baffled, baffled me about Casabetti's. Yeah. Like, listening to Peter Falk be like, I didn't know what the f- he was asking me to do. I don't know why he wanted me to do it, but I would just do it. And, yeah. and like, there's, there is this surrender to their performances. That's just so, so remarkable. One of my favorite scenes in that movie, um, is t- towards the end of the film when, uh, the doctor shows up, Dr. Zepp. Mm-hmm. And the first thing she says, it goes, Oh, nobody here needs a doctor. And it's just like, Oh, it's so heartbreaking. And the way she like tries to perform and like offers, you know, makes him a drink. It's like the way she's able to control her character and her emotions is, is, is unlike anything. It's so, so cool. Mabel, did you take a pill? Did you take any pills? A pill? Mm Mm-hmm. What? Is morphine a pill? Mm Mm-hmm. Sure, I've taken pills. I've uh, vitamin pills and uh, sleeping pills. Uppers, downers, inners, outers. What did you tell him, Mama? Did I drink? Yes, you drank. And it also, I was watching it again today and watching the arc of that emotional journey, which you would expect it to go careening up, 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 up until it explodes in this like loud, kind of uh, this loud moment, but it, it gets quieter Mm -hmm. as she's losing consciousness. Mm -hmm. It's getting quieter. She's like, she's like, she's leaving. I don't know. And I think that, um, that size, that small gentleness of her performance in that is actually so much scarier. I would think as a performer, you know, than the kind of like histrionics, those are sort of like, that's easy to do, but to kind of sit on top of it and let it like peter out, it's just remarkable. Yeah, yeah. and we, we talked about Peter Falk, right? So Peter Falk plays uh, Mabel, plays Nick, who is Mabel's husband. And he is also just, he's such a complex character mm-hmm. because there are times you're like, you really hate him. And then there are times where you're like, I mean, he's really doing like the best he can and doing what he understands is like the right thing to do. And yet he's coming from like so much love. Yeah. Like he's just incapable of coping with it, but at the same time, incapable of having her not be that thing. Yeah. Like he actually wants her to have all of that life that she has. And yet, yeah, I was also watching, there's this part and I, I've seen this movie like 50 times. Oh. Like, I'm not joking, like 50 times. And I watched uh, this morning when I was watching it again, there's a scene where she comes home from the hospital and he has just, he has just sort of slapped, slapped her and says like, do the bat bat, do the bat bat thing. And then they go, um, they come downstairs and he goes, okay, everybody like into the living, like into the dining room, let's have fun. Let's talk, you talk, Mm -hmm. talk to each other. And they walk in, the, it cuts to inside the living room or the dining room and the curtains part as if it's a f-ing performance because huh. everybody walks in like, yeah, blah, like all yeah, like yeah. high and kind of like, blah, like everything's fine. And I had never, I'd never noticed that before. And I was just like, oh, f- you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, we, we get it. Okay. We get it. You're great. So for those who are not familiar with Cassavetes, he's basically known as like the godfather of indie film. He self-funded a lot of his movies way back in the 70s and it's highly influential, like even today to I think most directors now, especially the indie film directors would point to him as a massive influence. Um, And something I got on this watch was, um, did you watch Marriage Story with- um, I've seen the first, 
I, I had to turn it off because it was uh, trigger. It was triggering me. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> I was okay, like, okay. I'm That's not fair. ready for this. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Yeah. So whenever you watch it, if you ever watch it, I uh-huh. do think there is no marriage story without like a woman under the influence mm-hmm. because marriage story is so raw and obviously able to trigger like very heavy emotions for people who like relate to that situation. Yeah. Um, that I think like woman under the influence still has this influence uh, yep. in in film all these years later it, it's pretty you know. totally and his film his the like anytime I work with a director and they're like we're thinking of Casavetti I'm like I'm in <laughs> you know what I mean <laughs> it's like a shorthand to okay you want to do something that I'm down for you know yeah. like you have the you have the I you, you want to play in a world that I'm excited about you know yeah. Um, and so my last thing here is that I noticed uh, Gina Rollins is even your Twitter header photo. I'm upset. Uh, also, I have like there's two posters, two women posters in my house. There's two. My friend painted her for me. There's a little like headshot there. Uh, yeah, it's like the beacon for me. It's it's yeah. As she good as she should. I mean, any any young actor. Uh, who is listening to this and you haven't seen this, please go watch it. It's seriously like a, a performance that, again, you can watch 50 times and still catch things that are that are in there from the acting and the directing and the, and the, and the writing. It's pretty unbelievable. All right, let's go uh, next in chronological order. Big change. Very excited. Uh, this is 1991's Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2, The Secret of the Ooze. <laughs> Which you literally like pumped your fist in the air when you said it. <laughs> uh, six one out of ten, fifty thousand ratings okay. on IMDb. Okay. Directed by Michael Pressman, written by Kevin Eastman, Peter Laird. They did the comic book, but the screenplay is by Todd Langan, starring Paige Turco, Ernie Reyes Jr., Robbie Riss, Brian Tochi, Laurie Faso, and Adam Carl as the AKA various turtles. You, you mean Raphael? Yes, Raphael, yeah, Michael yeah. Andrew, Donatello, yeah. Leonardo. <laughs> um, so talk to me about this one. Set the scene for right. Secret of the Ooze. Well, so I watched it again last night just to just to refresh. Again, have seen it probably I, this one I've probably seen a hundred times, and I know <laughs> that because I can quote the impact sounds of some of the fights. Like I know it so well. Um, I don't. Um, so many of my friends have fought me on like why this one versus the first one. The first one that was in my questions actually. <laughs> yeah, and I think I was too young when the first one came out. I was like too scared of it. Like, I th- I think I saw it in theaters and was way too scared. And it, like, had a, it, it was a bit grittier. Yeah, way grittier. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, even their design was a little less, like, um, uh, like, yeah, relatable. I mean, <laughs> yeah, the plot of the first one is, like, abandoned boys or people who feel like they're not loved by their parents should go rob things in this, like, New York crime syndicate. Yes. <laughs> like, much <totally>. darker. <laughs> yeah. So dark. Sam Rockwell blasts past camera yeah. at one point in an arcade. <laughs> You want lucky strikes? You want uh, filters yeah. or no filters? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I just was, I, I I, think we had the VHS of the first one recorded from TV. Sorry, whatever, copyright. Um, <laughs> but it started when Elliot Matias and Raph, that's his, played by, what's his name? Casey Jones. Casey Jones, yeah. And he's yes. like, he's like, cricket, you got to know what a crumpet is to understand cricket, cricket. or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's where our, our um, VHS kicked in. Uh, it was like the whole kind of origin story. Like it, it was, yeah, it just didn't secret of the ooze. I got for Christmas and watched every day, every day for years and had such a, a crush on Raph was just of like, but of co- but what a disaster, like what a disaster <laughs> that he was the one. <laughs> it says so much bad shit about me <laughs> that I was like, I want the guy who like, the runs off because he's angry. Yeah, yeah the bad exactly. boy. Yeah, the bad boy. What even happens in this movie? They find the the origin, and they actually there's like you know a semblance of like coming to sort of uh, existential crisis where they're like where Donnie is like I thought it would be more. I thought we'd be more than just like yes. turtles in ooze. Yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> that that. That was in my notes. So for context for folks who aren't as familiar with the turtles as we obviously are, uh, the turtles started off as little baby turtles. They got into some 
chemical ooze and they became teenage mutant ninja turtles uh (laughs) and donatello you know they meet one of the uh scientists who worked on it and just said yeah like it was an accident it just fell down the sewer and you guys got it and then donatello walks away and my note was donatello's immediate existential crisis after finding out it was all a mistake what troubles you my son Uh, i don't know i just always thought there'd be more to it to the ooze, to, you know, us. I know. I always thought there'd be something that, uh, I thought we'd find out we were special. Do not confuse the specter of your origin with your present worth, my sons. I don't believe him. There's just got to be more to it. Perhaps the search for a beginning really has so easy an end and it's funny because that's such a throwaway line like yeah. that could be the whole, the whole movie could be about the turtles like having this existential realization like holy crap like we, like this could have been anybody but it's just <laughs> literally like it's a minute long scene and then that's <laughs> yeah then we cut away let's go see vanilla ice <laughs> right. um, yeah what does he say because i hadn't actually clocked that until this last viewing again <laughs> As an adult watching it, it's a different right. thing, right? right? Than when you're a kid, you're just hearing sounds. Right. Um, but he's like, I thought it would be more than this. Yeah. And it is kind of like, I was like, oh, you know what? In like my weird COVID brain, like this is sort of <laughs> relatable. Suddenly yeah. I'm like, I know why this, you know, why this yeah. is an impactful uh, <laughs> legacy that the turtles have left us. Oh, something I meant to bring up earlier is that it's funny you say, you know, the first one was too gritty. Yeah. So uh, what's crazy is the first one came out in 1990. This one came out in 91. So they just went like back to back immediately. Oh, yeah. Whoa. Yeah, it's back to back. And then the feedback they got on the first one that it was too dark, too violent. Uh-huh. And so the second one, they like, I actually didn't know this until I was reading up before I watched it again, mm-hmm. that um, the, you know, parents said it was too violent with the weapons. So actually most of the time they're just fighting with like their fists and like random toys, That's like towels and stuff like that. Yeah. So it's funny. Yeah, like that. hot dog links. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like exactly. a like a clown a clown like a clown a, thing yeah floaty punching thing yeah the thing. Yeah. Guy, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so it's funny that even as obviously they were correct because as a kid you related to the second one because it was not as like you know intense as, ag- as aggressive to yeah watch. I think like one of the actual like one of the climax fights is Toka or Razor spinning Michelangelo or Donatello in a circle just spinning uh-huh. him holding him by his hands yeah it's very kind of demure. <laughs> And yeah. then throwing him through like a very soft cardboard wall. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With with his big shell too. Yeah. Um, so before we jump to this, I gotta ask uh, Super Shredder. Oh yeah. At the end <laughs> of the movie, it's so insane. So <clears throat> again, for context, Shredder gets they think he they think he's defeated, but he turns out to have a vial of ooze, and he comes out in the last scene just hulked out his he classic has, hand through the rubble. yeah the hand through yeah. the rub and yeah. he seems to have he somehow got a new outfit because his outfit completely yes. changed well. it becomes really spiky yeah like really really spiky. spiky yeah but then in that scene they don't even really fight him he's just punching a pier that he's under and then it just collapses on him he throws the other thing. his own demise yeah because poetic. he took his powers the ooze powers and didn't use them for good he just used them to walk <laughs> under the boardwalk too close to all the beams and punch out all the beams on top of his head. I mean, I mean, what a death. it's poetry. Yeah. It's poetry. It really, there's so many things. There's so many themes in that script <laughs> that we really uh, need to dig into. We need to get you on a turtles project, like an official turtles project. I, you gotta, I, you gotta please. get the animation, all that sort of stuff. You have voice acting skills. I mean, uh, come on. Give me, give, put me in coach. I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you're enjoying this week's episode of Movies That Changed My Life. If you are, don't forget to hit the subscribe button to make sure that you get all of our new episodes as soon as they are available. Because trust me, you won't want to miss the incredible guests we have coming up to nerd out about some of their favorite movies, like Darren Chris, Chelsea Handler, and Felicia Day, just to name a few. Thanks again for listening. Be sure to check out imdb.com slash podcasts for more content and to easily add the movies that we talk about on this show to your IMDb watch list. Now let's get back to movies that changed my life with Tatiana Maslany. We're in June. It's Pride Month. And I know the uh, Clone Club or the Orphan Black uh, reunion table read went to a charity. Do you want to talk about that for a little bit? Yeah. So Centerlink um, is an organization that helps um, 
community centers, LGBTQ community centers across North America, um, Puerto Rico, um, all, all over the world, Australia, uh, Canada, um, helps them, uh, you know, garner resources and create spaces for people and really seeks to like um, center um, LGBTQ people in, in all ways and, and empower them. So um, we were really happy to like ally ourselves with that organization because they just have such incredible reach. And then um, the other organization we were raising money for is a smaller charity in Toronto, which is where we filmed Orphan Black. And they're called Sister in Toronto and they provide uh, so many different resources for um, women and trans people who are precariously housed or homeless in, in Toronto really happy to be able to to give back in some way and fans can still watch that table read still donate all sort of stuff on the facebook on the uh official orphan black facebook on the official one perfect yes (laughs) which i had to like reinstate my facebook account just to (laughs) to be back on that (laughs) well it made all the it made the clone club very happy uh let's go 2004's shawn of the dead Yes. Uh, this is a 7.9 out of 10 with oh. 496,000 ratings on IMDb, directed by Edgar Wright, written by Simon Pegg and Edgar Wright, starring Simon Pegg, Nick Frost, Kate Ashfield, Lucy Davis, uh, Dylan Moran, Bill Nye. Nye? Um, Nye. Nye. <laughs> uh, and then the very the synopsis is, a man's uneventful life is disrupted by the zombie apocalypse, uh, which <laughs> is very much the synopsis, but also there's a lot more to that. Yeah. Um, so set the scene uh, on this one. Sean, to me, was like... in my mind like a perfect film because it like straddled every it it loved the genre that it was mocking it it didn't even mock it it just loved it it like fully loved it and then just twisted it in this way that was so unexpected and like used all these incredible tropes and used like such nerdy like callbacks to old zombie movies or you know like um Ah, the evil dead movies or whatever mm-hmm. lines that were repurposed you know what i mean yeah even like you know i think the the store um the first zombie like the first zombie in their backyard yeah uh, like she's wearing a pin of i think the store's name is the name of a character in like night of the living dead or, or something, oh, something is like that, that right yeah there's always like little like little trivia things that edgar wright kind of does that in all his movies but yeah. this one obviously is so like in tribute of a genre they do a ton of that yes and sean at one point i think the person one of the people who works in the store he's like ash is out sick oh yes yes yeah and there's like all these little great like that are way over my head but just make me so happy that i just love that kind of like super nerdy love of anything you know right fandoms like yes we were talking about fandoms. earlier so how many times have you seen this one? Is this also on your high ranking? Yes. The, I think the reason I picked all of these films is because I've seen them up, up or like at least 30, you know, at least 30 to 40 times. It's amazing. Yeah. Uh, uh, so some things that on my notes about my most recent rewatch of this is that Edgar Wright um, is such a master of using sound to mm-hmm. his advantage. And obviously that plays off like in folds for Baby Driver, which he does... Uh, a couple years later, but <clears throat> my note was like, um, when people are talking, like you hear every bite they're doing, yes. uh, like if they're eating food or, or like when they're having breakfast or, or even like all the video game sound effects or when it picks up the phone, it's like, we do whoosh, yes. like all these cool little things like that. And it like, it really like makes you a part of the movie. And it's so cool that he does that. Um, and, and it just com- completes the whole thing as, as one like cohesive piece. Over the head. Yes, like the sound design and the visual choices are so um, almost cartoony. Yeah. Like almost like so arch that 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 like it would jump out in a movie that didn't have like it's just so structurally sound. Like it's so um, every like meticulously chosen every yeah. shot, every like little illusion, every like, like throwback to a previous time when we've seen this exact same shot, but now when they fall into it, they're covered in blood or, you know what I mean? Like it's really um, meticulous. 
Yeah, and like the way they do uh, the physical comedy, I think is so perfectly done. Like, mm -hmm. you know, obviously physical comedy, it can be hit or miss for some people, but there's a lot of things in here that if it just wasn't, maybe if it wasn't Simon Pegg or if it wasn't Edgar Wright doing this, like the scene where um, <clears throat> they're trying to get to the bar that they want to <laughs> eventually end yeah. in and Simon Pegg's walking and they're like, what are you doing? Like there's there, all these fences there and Simon yeah. Pegg goes, what's the matter? You've never taken a shortcut before and he just <laughs> immediately falls over. Like it's so <laughs> dumb, but it's, it's so, so perfect. Dumb. Yeah, I've seen that moment so many times in the last night. I was like, <gasps> like laughed yeah. out loud as if I'd never seen it before. Yeah. And like, even if you know it's coming, it's just so stupid and perfect at the time. It's like, yes. you know, they're in the zombie apocalypse and he's just like, yeah, let's just go hop over fences. Like I can do it. Just kind of show off or, <laughs> or when he goes to look um, where to, to suss out where the zombies are. Oh my God. He stand, he walks up the little slide <laughs> and just disappears <laughs> from frame and his little feet come down again. And it's yeah. just so like, simple and stupid and yeah because like the shot it makes it look like it's a ladder and yes. then it just pans up just a little bit yeah. and you see it's on top of like a little kid slide oh it's so good it's so good uh but we would be remiss to talk about Shaun of the dead without talking about one of the best needle drops in film history uh don't stop me now in the final oh bar my God. scene the soundtrack is it's the best soundtrack yeah and i used to just listen to that soundtrack like it was going out of stuff i loved it it, it, it hits so good again knowing don't stop me now it's coming it's like you're in anticipation waiting for like that jukebox to turn on yes and then uh what he says like, kill the queen it's like kill the yeah. queen it's like the jukebox <laughs> it's on random yeah and then and then they're just hitting that barkeep yeah it's just kind of like a useless zombie <laughs> standing in the middle and they're just hitting him to the rhythm yeah it's, with like thin pool cues my last note on this is that i also love that edgar wright and simon pegg do this like with their uh you know the three flavors cornetto trilogy they take yeah. these very like absurd situations but make them um so like very kind of real also at the end of this movie like you're kind of laughing the whole way and then they're deciding like well we got to go like everyone's kind of dying do we stay back like we're gonna go yeah. sacrifice ourselves and like um there's that quote uh sean says where he goes the only thing that will redeem mankind is cooperation i think we can all appreciate the relevance of that right now and that even hits home a little differently, like in today's world, right? Totally. It was so different watching it now. And I wanted to watch it when quarantine started because it felt like it would maybe be like a kind of s escape, but also like a diving into the chaos of what's <laughs> happening. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. yeah. Um, and it does really resonate differently now. Just like all of the language too. They talk about isolating. Um, they talk mm -hmm. about staying in, staying in your homes like all of this stuff, it's just really eerie. Um, and yeah, and I also love that the film, I think the reason it to me it's like a perfect movie is that it can go from, you know, they're in the back of the car and Philip, his dad is like dying or his, his stepdad is dying and starts telling him like, you know, you were you were just a kid when, when, I, when I came and I just wanted you to feel like you had a father. And I was proud of you. And you see like Simon Pegg just being a fucking amazing actor and mm -hmm. hearing it and being devastated and it's everything he's ever wanted to hear. And now he's losing this father figure. And then two seconds later, it's like comedy and horror. Back you know what insanity. I mean? <laughs> yeah. You also got to, uh, you did a photo shoot with The Hollywood Reporter where you got to be dressed up as Sean yes. in a bar, uh, that had to be your quest, right? Like that yeah, was oh, your yeah, like- Yeah, totally. Okay. They, they said, I don't remember what the question, what the like prompt was, but it was like, what, who would you cos cosplay as or something? And they're like, mm -hmm. I think they were like, we're thinking Wonder Woman or whatever. And I was like, can sure. I be Sean of the Dead? <laughs> <laughs> they're like, okay, but you have to wear heels. <laughs> I was wearing like red heels for some reason. <laughs> Um, cause, of, cause of, uh, being a lady, but we shot that in like a bar in London. Oh really? So that was in London even? Yes. Okay. And the nice. two guys in the back were just like, uh, like basically like the photographer's crew oh, who were like the pressed up window. against the yeah. window. Yeah. But it was like such a, it was such a treat. I also realized how hard it is to make the face that Simon Pegg makes in that where he like, where he just looks just completely dumb. Yeah. <laughs> It's it's hard to be dumb, you know. It's hard. It he is makes very it look hard. So easy. He does. He does it perfectly. <laughs>
All right, let's go to the last movie. This is one of my favorite movies also. Yes. Uh, this is There Will Be Blood, 8.2 out of 10 on IMDb with 494,000 ratings, written and directed by the fantastic, iconic Paul Thomas Anderson, mm-hmm. uh, based on a novel by Upton Sinclair, starring Daniel Day-Lewis, uh, Paul Dano, Kieran Hines, and Dylan Frazier. Um, the synopsis is a story of family, religion, hatred, oil, and madness, focusing on the turn-of-the-century prospector in the early days of the oil business. Um, so set the scene on this. When was the first Nothing time Nothing about that that, that log line would ever make me want to watch this movie. <laughs> like, I could never. I'd be like, what? <laughs> oil um, prospecting. Oh, yeah. Who cares? Um, yeah, this movie I saw in the theaters in Toronto, in this tiny little theater um, at, called the Varsity. And there's these like VIP rooms where you spend a little bit extra money and they're like 30 seats and it's like tiny. Mm. I saw it with my friend Brendan and we were just howling through the whole film. I had, I wasn't super up on PTA's work at this point Mm -hmm. and had never really seen Daniel Day Lewis in much and was just like uproariously laughing because I was so like, like almost the feeling of being on like a roller coaster. Like it's just so much for your body to take, like that you yeah. can't help but like vocalize. Um, similarly to Jenna Rollins, there's like a, there's such um, a, f- I mean, Daniel Day Lewis is a different breed of like a different animal, but there's, there's still such a freedom and such a like inventiveness and so much humor in his work that is is like fascinating to me um and the soundtrack is incredible uh, johnny greenwood of oh uh, radiohead God. yes my, all of those like industrial yeah parts uh, moving i i love johnny greenwood scores so much they're i love radiohead but yeah johnny greenwood scores are so so amazing uh yeah so daniel day lewis unbelievable um it's funny watching your <clears throat> opening um your, your sister Alice intro in um, Perry Mason mm-hmm. that I got, vi- like when I saw that and I knew that you had picked There Will Be Blood, um, Daniel Day-Lewis basically, there's no dialogue for 15 minutes in the movie and then he does this amazing monologue to um, some mm-hmm. city dwellers where he wants to buy land to start oil dwelling, uh, oil rigging and then Paul Dano's character who he plays twins, we'll get that a little bit, he also has like a really crazy sermon to introduce mm-hmm. like his character um, and so it's funny. I thought I thought of that actually. Did that cross your mind at all when you were sort of put together the Sister Alice character? Yes, I definitely. Why I rewatched the film for a lot of reasons. There was something about to like uh, a film that's set in a different mm. time, but feels so contemporary, like contemporary in performance. Like there's nothing about it that feels uh, other than you know there's certain things, but it it just feels so human. Um, and definitely was watching Paul Dano's work because. He, I hate him in this movie. Oh my God. Like yeah. I hate him. <laughs> and I'm so uh, impressed by that ability to be that like, ugh. you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. He, he's, he's so good. So Paul Dano wasn't even supposed to be twins. Uh, he was only supposed to be like the, the brother we see in the beginning who sells the land. Yes. Um, and then, PTA was like, we need you just to do both characters. And he's so good. And so uh, like you hate him, but he's amazing at it. He's fantastic. He's amazing. And he similarly to Daniel Day Lewis and to Jenna Rollins are like unafraid to be the kind of ugliest version of themselves. Peter Falk too, like, and Cassavetes. Like, I think they just all had like an, have an interest in those like uglier sides of humanity. Um, yeah, and I just find it so thrilling to watch that kind of work. Like, it feels so liberating. When, so when you first watched it, you said you enjoyed it a lot. What, did you, like, love it right away? Or, uh, you know, I feel like whenever people talk about There Will Be Blood, it's either, like, you it's a masterpiece from the get-go, or, like, after you see it a couple of times, it really, like, hits home. And I'm, I'm, on the, I'm that way with Paul Thomas Anderson. He's one of my favorite directors. Um, and But I always really like his movies the first time, but they almost all require multiple viewings just to get what he's doing. 
um, totally. as a, you know, it, 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 so was that the same for you for this? Oh yeah, entirely. And also I'm like completely stupid when it comes to plot. <laughs> so the first time I watch a movie and like, <laughs> this is like not a lie. I'm still learning plot stuff about <laughs> all of these films we're talking about. Um, but I really get an emotional hit off of it or like a character hit or like that moment or that image or whatever it's like those are the hits that I get and then I like go back and then go like oh that like if you ask me who any of the characters were in there will be blood Mm -hmm. I I could not tell you sure yeah like I remember watching I was watching Sopranos with my ex the one time and he was like we what we finished this one scene ended and I was like whoa and he was like (laughs) yeah, that's crazy how like so-and-so and do 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 or like sure. ding-dong-dinging. And I was like, huh? And he was like, what do you think happened in that scene? I was like, I don't know. I just like them talking to each other. <laughs> like literally I just watch it for the behavior. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like I yeah. watch it for the, the, the way the actors are like bouncing off of each other and like the emotional impact that I'm getting from the story. I love The Sopranos. I still have not watched it. You haven't, oh, so you just saw that one episode. I saw, I saw like half of the first season. I was like, wow, no idea what happened. I know he went to a therapist and there were some ducks. There are, there are ducks. That's there true. That's ducks. correct. Uh, there you'll will make, be ducks. There, there will be ducks. Nice. <laughs> um, some things uh, when I was researching this movie also. So Daniel Day-Lewis improvised the speech he gives to the people of Little Boston where he talks about building schools and bringing bread. He's like, I see your soil is dry. Like, you don't have wheat. We'll bring you bread. Or something else. Uh, and please don't be insulted if I speak about this bread. Let's talk about bread. Now, to my mind, uh, it's an abomination to consider that to any man, woman, or child in this magnificent country of ours should have to look upon a loaf of bread as a luxury. We're going to dig water wells here, and uh, water wells means irrigation, and irrigation means cultivation. We're going to raise crops here where before it just simply wasn't possible. You're going to have more grain than you know what to do with. He improvised that. No! Yes. But see, this is what is so cool about him, is that, like, he's so in it, and he's so unembarrassed to sound... Like he's so in it. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah, he, yeah, totally. He sounds. Uh, ugh, that's so exciting to me. Yeah, he's he's crazy. I mean, for people who don't know, uh, Daniel Day Lewis is a is a method actor, and by that he when he takes a role, he literally lives to be that character. Um, you know, for things like uh, the, um, Gangs of New York, he trained to be a butcher. He actually had like so he has a glass eye in that movie. He uh-huh. actually put in a real glass contact for the no. whole filming. So you know the scene where he taps his eye with a knife? Uh-huh. He trained himself to do, that's real. What he a maniac. Him, what, what a, a psycho. goof. <laughs> <laughs> what an absolute goof. Though. I know. Like, that's insane. It's I like, love that. He's, he's trained himself to tap himself with an eye. Like, that's that committed to the craft he is. It, it's, it's, I, I'm so sad so he, he's retiring from acting. I um, know. But I, but I get it. Like, he takes it, like, his body and, like, mental and his, his family must be angels for dealing with whatever totally. they have to go through when he's but training also, for that. like, wouldn't you quit while you were so ahead as yeah. well? Like, you don't right. want to peter out, right? Like, go yeah. off on Phantom Thread, like an I, absolute genius. I, know. I love Phantom Thread. I do, That's, too. That's God. another performance that just, like, um, that, have you ever watched the outtakes of There Will Be Blood? No. Oh, God, they're so good. Yeah. <laughs> there's, cause as much as he is, like, super method, there's this one, that one scene where he's, like, in uh, the restaurant and those guys come in, the guys mm-hmm. who's going to make a deal with at one point. Yeah, yeah. with his son. The plot. And, yeah. and he sees his son, yeah. His son has just come back to him. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he puts, like, the, the, like, napkin over his face. Yeah. And he's talking about oil, uh, or like um, what, standard oil or whatever. Yeah. So they, there's like a little bit at the end of that scene. I think they yell cut and then you, you can hear the crew laugh a little and he like kind of laughs. It's like, you know, seeing the magician's trick. Like it's So just you are like, a human sometimes. Yes. <laughs> yes. So human. And then uh, my last note on this that I thought was interesting. So the I drink your milkshake line. That's actually based off something that was said in Congress in nineteen tw- in the nineteen twenties. No. Um, 
Yeah, so I get, in, in sort of the same context, I guess it was called the Teapot Dome Scandal, which I forget uh-huh. what that means. But sure. I guess a, a, a congressman said, like, if I have a long straw, I will drink your milkshake. I always say that around our house. I always go to my wife, like, I drink your milkshake. <laughs> and she's like, <laughs> she's like, please stop. <laughs> yeah. um, but it's such a, it seems like such a random line, but it's cool that it, like, again, it's, it's, it's uh, credence to PTA and Dana Day Lewis that they can take find these lines and it just yeah. works so perfectly for it. I wonder who found, I wonder which one of them had sourced that. And yeah. also it's like so absurd that it would have to be real. Mm-hmm. Like it's one of those things you'd be like, no one would say that in real life. Like <laughs> nobody would say that. Right. Except for Daniel Plainview. But Except apparently for Daniel Plainview. Um, also, yeah. also very much in my hit in terms of <laughs> man, I'm going to marry <laughs> his whole thing. His whole thing. The, the hat, the mustache, all that he sorts of stuff. With bowed legs like somebody who has worked labor his whole life if you watch those big field scenes where he's just walking his legs are like they're not they're not near what the fan you know what i mean what his physicality is in phantom threat or anything i mean pta even said he wouldn't if daniel day lewis didn't accept the role they might have not made the movie i could see that yeah i mean he's just like this is the role for him and he needs to do it love that Unless John C. Riley was going to do it. Unless John C. Riley was going to do it. Different movie, but also, (laughs) I am here for it. (laughs) Well, fantastic. So, A Woman Under the Influence, Shaun of the Dead, There Will Be Blood, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles 2, The Secret of the Use. Uh, Do you see a through line between uh, the four of the movies? I was trying to think. I know that there's definitely, there's definitely something about masculinity in it. Masculinity Mm. being kind of like, Versions of masculinity sort of being your undoing. I'm just coming to this now. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. You know, Super Shredder. We've got Daniel Plainview. We've got, um, you know, Peter, the the, the, like oppressive thing of Peter Falk's husbandry and uh, and Sean's like kind of entitled apathy. Yeah. I'm going to go with that, which is also like my whole mandate in life. It's just like, (laughs) (laughs) I love that. That's perfect. I don't know. Do you see what? The, the, so the thrill line I saw is that you uh, like that these movies all sort of kind of obviously like with the orphan black lens around it is that a lot of these people are playing multiple versions of themselves within the movie. Ooh, I love that. So, so uh, Jenna Rollins, obviously she has her multiple personalities thing yeah. where she's on one level on not uh, Paul Dano literally plays two characters. Yes. Uh, Secret of the Ooze is about transformation in a way, right? And it's about uh, like four four guys who look identical. But four guys who totally, look identical. They're, they're, one of them's a partier. The other one's a yeah, scientist. The, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then even Shaun of the Dead, I mean, it has all like, I, you know, the personalities of all like the friends are all sort of like, they need to all be there for each other. So I, I thought that through the eyes of like your work. Love that. Okay. I think that's so cool. I'll take that. <laughs> And masculinity, though. And masculinity, <laughs> perfect, because yeah. they both work. Uh, well, amazing, amazing. So Perry Mason comes out on HBO June 21st. Yes. Um, you play, again, the incredible Sister Alice. Yeah. Uh, any other things about Perry Mason? I'm, I'm really excited for people to see it. I'm super proud of it, and uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's I think great. it's, it's, it's going to be a fun one to watch. Uh, yeah. And then, again, so we talked about this earlier, but make sure you go watch the uh, – the Orphan Black Charity Reunion Table Read, you're still able to donate um, to what was the charity again? I'm Centerlink, sorry. and Centerlink. the other one is Sistering Toronto. Well, this was a lot of fun. This is so fun. Yes, I'm glad uh, we got you onto, the, onto this. I think people will be very excited to hear you talk about all this stuff. I, thank you so much. Perfect, thank you. Bye. Thanks again for listening. We will be back next week with two episodes featuring Darren Chris and Chelsea Handler. Uh, don't forget, go to imdb.com slash podcast for more content and to easily add movies that we talk about on this show to your IMDb watch list. Thanks a lot, and we'll see you next week.